So as promised last time, we're going to continue discussing the Lila of Lord Nityananda. And this is the, we left off with the Lila of Lord Nityananda meeting Lord Chaitanya at the home of Nanda Nacharya. So I promised we would continue reading a little more just to get more absorbed in this amazing pastime. We're reading from a book called Nityananda Charita. And uh, first I'll do a kirtan, a new kirtan I came up with by accident. Hare Krishna. Namo Om Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale, Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itchi Namane, Namaste Sarasati Deve, Gauravani Pachadine, Nirvi Sesa Sanyavati Pashtacha Vasitra. Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithananda Shyadaya Kivadar Hare Shiva Sari Gaur Bhakti Vindu. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare Rama, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna. Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare 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 Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. 
Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Hare 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 Rama Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Hare Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Hare Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare. Gaura Premanandi Hari Hari. Did you know that the reason Krishna Das Kaviraj went to Vrindavan is because he had a dream and Lord Nityananda appeared to him in a dream? actually appeared as Krishna. And he told him to go to Vrindavan. And you'll find in the Leela so many things happen in dreams. And I had an amazing dream last night. I was watching, in the dream, I was watching a video of Rath Yatra. But it turned out that the dream was a time machine. And it was a three-dimensional video. And I walked into the dream. And Jayananda Prabhu, it was Rath Yatra, and Jayananda Prabhu was there. And I thought, I'll just walk right behind him so that I can feel his mercy and I can pick up some of his Krishna consciousness. So I walked into the video and walked right behind him and there I was 30 years ago. <laughs> Isn't that nice? But anyway, um, so many revelations are given in dreams, so many instructions are given in dreams. It's, a, it's, it's just very common. So we had left off we had left off reading, if you may remember on Friday, about Lord Chaitanya meeting Nitananda Prabhu and Nitananda Prabhu did not start his preaching mission until Mahaprabhu started his preaching mission. Then at that time Nitananda Prabhu was thirty two years old, Mahaprabhu was twenty years old. And at that time Nitananda Prabhu was looking for Mahaprabhu. And he asked someone, where is Krishna, where is Krishna? And they said, Krishna is in Bengal. <laughs> so he, he went to Bengal. And when he came, as we had mentioned last week, when he came, Mahaprabhu knew that he had arrived. And he told 
Takaharidas and I believe Srivast find him, but they couldn't find him. And the significance of that is that you can't find Krishna unless Krishna allows you to find him. And you also can't find him unless you're qualified. Of course, they were qualified, but it was a pastime. that You need some qualification to find Krishna. And as we've discussed before, you need some qualification to see him when you find him because you might see him and not know that it's him. So, as we told, the story goes, uh, Srivas and Takaharidas could not find him, although they searched eight or nine hours throughout the Nabadweep Mayapur area. Then Mahaprabhu said uh, the next day, uh, I know where he is, we will go there. And so the next day they went. And uh, the scene was um, amazing, as we had discussed and full of transcendental ecstasies. And so what happened was Nita Nanda was exhibiting all kinds of ecstasies in seeing Mahaprabhu. And these ecstasies were so intense that many times he couldn't control himself and all devotees are just watching this, just amazed. And they also become uh, became ecstatic. It was like a contagious contagious disease of ecstasy by watching it. And these kinds of ecstasies are are uncommon. They're exhibitions of the highest prema, and so they're quite uncommon. You read more about them than you see them. And so now, so now all the devotees were seeing. And we had left off that uh, Nityananda was fainting in ecstasy, and he ended up on the lap of Mahaprabhu. And everyone was saying, this is like um, Anantasesh. Instead of the Lord lying on Anantasesh, Anantasesh is now lying on the Lord. And then some were saying, this looks like Rama and Lakshman. And others were saying, this looks like Krishna and Balaram. Some are saying, this looks like Arjuna and Krishna. This looks like Anantasesh and Krishna. So, I think one thing we can understand in the leelas of Mahaprabhu, it's like um, Chaitanya Charitamrita said, he opened up the floodgates, like whatever. whatever. Nothing is being held back now. So, full manifest manifestations of love of Krishna are being exhibited by Nityananda Prabhu, and also then uh, uh, Mahaprabhu, and then the other devotees. So, and I promised you we would continue reading because I know I I could see you were all like like really wanted to uh, continue the ecstasy. So, I believe we ended up reading. Right at the end of the story of their meeting, I'm not sure how far we, we got, but I will read a little bit and we will discuss. Due to the lack of light, I need to wear these glasses. And the fact that this book is published on kind of an off-white paper with brown ink, so the contrast is not so great. Hmm. Fully absorbed, the most enchanting Lord Goranga relentlessly offered prayers to Lord Nityananda. There were so many talks between Lord Nityananda and Lord Chaitanya but most of them were done with gestures. Lord Chaitanya said, I am afraid to ask you, where are you from? The mentality of Nityananda was very childish, and he was overwhelmed with intense ecstasy. He spoke like a restless boy. Lord Nityananda knew the cause of the appearance of his Lord. He thus folded his hands and spoke very humbly. Hearing the words of Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda felt shy. 
Therefore, he began to reveal his real identity, Lord Nityananda said. I've traveled to many holy places. I have also seen all the holy places where Krishna did his pastimes. I saw only the holy places, but could not find Krishna there. I asked some exalted personality, Why do I see only thorns? The places of pastimes are all empty and covered. Can you tell me where Krishna went? He told me that Krishna has gone to Bengal. Recently he was at Gaya, but now he returned to Nabadweep. I have heard that joyous Sankirtan of the Holy Names is being done in Nadia. Some people say that Lord Narayan has appeared here. I have also heard that Nadia is famous for the deliverance of the fallen souls. So being most sinful as I am, I have come here. Isn't it interesting how both Lord Nitananda and Lord Chaitanya are are playing the part well they're playing they're playing the actual role is to deliver as many people who will take their mercy as possible. But they also play the part of an ordinary person. Like I want I want to be Krishna conscious. So I want to find Krishna and I'm a lowly, sinful, fallen person. And so how do we understand that? Uh, we understand it as they teach us how we should behave, how we should think. You know, we think we're special. And you often see that the devotee will admit, I am a lowly, sinful person. What does that mean? It means I've committed unlimited numbers of sins we're all guilty of that and and so they that humility expresses itself as i'm unqualified because in the, in the bhagavad gita krishna says when you finish your sins then you can become uh, qualified end of the seventh chapter krishna talks about yesham tvantagata papam antagata papam you finish your sins then you can take bhakti. And if you've done piety, punya, then you're qualified. Many births of punya. Jananam punya karmanam. Te dvanta nirha moha nirmukta. Then you can become free from duality and then you can surrender. So the devotee, the mentality of the devotee is I've committed many sins and I'm unqualified. That's the humility of a devotee. And from Prabhupada's example and the example of so many great devotees, we understand they are never proud of having any qualification, but they're always very ashamed of the fact that they've committed many sins. So this is the humility of a Vaishnava. So we, we should, when we read stories in which the Vaishnava is exhibiting this humility, we should pick up on it and pray or try to get some of this to rub off on us, to not think, oh, I'm so qualified because I can do A, B, and C. They don't think that way. And if they can do A, B, and C, they don't think it's because they're qualified. They think it's it's a gift or it's it's the kripa of their guru. But generally they're thinking, my past is sinful and I'm unqualified. That's the humility of a devotee. And even Nityananda Prabhu is, is feeling that at this moment, at least exhibiting it for us. Now, it seems that you would you would think, we would all think, that when a devotee exhibits this great kind of humility, they're just doing it for us. It's not that they are sinful or it's not that they feel sinful. And it's interesting because they don't have to be sinful to feel sinful. Just like we've discussed before, Lord Chaitanya felt very bad that he was eating. Why was he feeling bad that he was eating? Because eating would maintain his life. Why was he feeling bad that he would maintain his life? Is because he didn't have love of Krishna. So he felt, well, that's kind of sinful to live without love of Krishna. Like, what's the point? So I'm eating. 
and and that now has become a sin. So their definition of sin changes as they evolve in Krishna consciousness. So even if I've committed one sin in my life, I feel, oh, I'm so sinful. I'm unqualified for love of Krishna. I'm, I'm unfortunate because of my impiety. That's the humility that we want to pick up from these stories. And, and as you know, humility is not easy to pick up, but, but in our Shastra, the examples are abundant. And so if we just open our eyes and notice, oh, this is how a devotee thinks, this is how a devotee feels, this is how a devotee expresses himself, and we see, oh, this is all the manifestation of humility, then hopefully some of that will wear off on us. So what I'm saying essentially here is don't, don't allow the humility of the devotees in the leelas of Gauranga Mahaprabhu or in, in Krishna's leela to go unnoticed by you and not to wear off on you in some way because humility is really the most important quality we can possess to become Krishna conscious um, and also the most difficult to get. Of course, you get it when you get love of Krishna, but how will you get love of Krishna if you ha if we have no humility? So, you get it when you get love of Krishna, but without humility, at least some, some realization of our fallen condition and some modesty and a motive in devotional service to not to always be aware, to not to not want to be glorified, but always to be aware of our fallen condition. That that is desirable. And in, in, in Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, in different occasions, has has said that the, the desire to be honored by devotees is is one of the worst desires, one of the worst things we could have. I'm trying to remember exactly what he said. Maybe some of you remember. This was from my humility course. But he used, he used some very, let us say, unkind words, perhaps. Unkind is not descriptive. Uh, the, basic, the basic impression I, I get, I got from reading it, because I can't remember the word now, is that to... To want to be honored in the assembly of devotees, to want to be honored by devotees, is yeah, I would say it's basically ab an abominable, abominable desire. It's a horrible desire. Um, yeah, uh, maybe I can look it up later. No, there's no document we're reading from this book. I need time. So, it's just so interesting how Nityananda Prabhu is coming across like this. Now, I got deviated. The question that we ask ourselves, or we ask others, when we see the manifestation of, maybe I answered it already, but we see the manifestation of great humility by a devotee, are they just, aren't they just doing this for us, so that we understand what humility is and we understand how to act, how to speak, how to interact in a humble way. And Prabhupada addressed this question and he said, no, they actually feel this way. And that was my point of even uh, Mahaprabhu not having love of God, he's feeling, he's feeling, I'm maintaining my life. That's sinful. So they actually feel this way. And the reason we have difficulty understanding why would a pure devotee feel this way is because the context in which they're thinking is different than our context. So I'm eating, that means I'm sinful. That's not our context. Our context of sin is the following, not following the four principles and other sinful activities. Their context is different. Uh, I'm not thinking of Krishna. I'm, I'm thinking, today I thought for a moment about enjoying myself. That's sinful. Like we have this story of Madhavendra Puri. He wanted to 
he went to um I was gonna say Raman Reti. It's not Raman Reti, it starts with an R in, in Arissa. To because the where where did he go? What's the name of that place? Why can't I remember? It's on the tip of my tongue. He went to the Ramuna. He went to Ramuna in Arissa. Um, because the sweet rice that was offered to the deity was out of this world, materially speaking and spiritually speaking. And he wanted to make that sweet rice for his deity. And he went there, he saw the sweet rice was on the altar being offered, and he was thinking, oh, you know, I'd really like to taste this so that I could, you know, know what the standard is so I could make it for my deity. So when he was thinking about tasting it, he was thinking about tasting it in service to his deity. That's what he was thinking. I would like to taste this so I know what it tastes like so I could make it for my deity. And then he thought, I have just been thinking about tasting the sweet rice of this deity. So he fasted, as I remember the story, he fasted for that. He felt that's so bad, it's so sinful. So that's my point, that a pure devotee will take something which he might consider a, um, a particle of something that uh, something that falls a particle short of pure unalloyed bhakti, and he thinks Sin I'm sinful. And then, but then you'll say, but Prabhu, this Bhakti Vinod Thakur is saying, he's saying, I think, I think if somebody's happy. Somebody is prospering. I think, I don't like that. <clears throat> I want to be prosperous. And if they're not prosperous, I think, oh, that's good. I'm prosperous and they're not. I think, does he actually think that way? Then you might say, he, he, is, just, he is just saying that because that's how we, we think. And that, of course, is there. There's no doubt that... Also, the Acharya is the Acharya, so he's setting that example. But my point is, if ever for a moment there is a thought for a nanosecond of anything other than pure bhakti, the, the pure devotee will think, oh, just see how sinful I am. We've been, we've been reading about, previously in Yogamaya, we were reading about the gopis who came and entered Krishna Leela and who were being trained up and how when Krishna played his flute some of those gopis were not yet pure and therefore they couldn't come. And so that's interesting, you know. Little, little impurity and it prevents you from from prema. So you may be on the stage of Baba. So Baba is described as almost love. There's a few things to work out. And so they had to work out a few things and in that pastime where they couldn't go to the rasa dance, they worked it out. So material contamination is very deep, and it may be just some little thing that's preventing love of God. So a devotee may feel that little thing that's preventing love of God as a huge sin, that I'm so sinful. So we see it in both ways. They are playing the role of ordinary conditioned souls, and as Prabhupada said, also feeling. So. Does Bhaktivinoda actually, is he actually happy when people suffer? Well, he did play the role of a materialistic person in his earlier life. So in that mood of that materialistic person, he's portraying this is how a materialistic person thinks and feels. Um, this is a horrible way to think and feel. But I think for us, that um, we see that example of what they're actually feeling and try to understand it, it will help us become a little humble. And it will help us also understand how humility is the natural symptom of pure bhakti. And you, you only find in Mahaprabhu's Leela, the ones who are most proud are people who are not pure devotees, or not devotees at all, but amongst, or if there is some pride amongst the Vaishnavas, it always creates a problem. Like it stands out, as we say, stands out like a sore thumb. It's like, this is wrong. Something's wrong here. 
uh, and the Mahaprabhu doesn't like it when his devotees are proud. Now you remember you remember the story of Maharaj Prataparudra. If you remember that story, if you know the story, you re- if you don't know the story, I'll tell it. But you, if you know it, you remember that Maharaj Prataparudra, who was the king of Orissa, want, was a great devotee and he wanted to meet Mahaprabhu. But Mahaprabhu, as a sannyasi, followed the etiquette of sannyas, and sannyasis do not associate with kings. The reason being that kings are worldly-minded people. Kings are surrounded by wealth, women, opulence, and so forth. So it would be dangerous for a sannyasi to associate with them. It would be contaminating to be in their presence. Mahaprabhu did not allow women to get near to him. Now, of course, you're saying, but Mahaprabhu is not attracted to women or kings and so forth. But he's playing the role of a sannyasi, therefore he's setting an example. And Maharaj Pantaparudra desperately wanted to meet Mahaprabhu because he was such a great devotee. And devotees were feeling compassion because his desire was so strong and he was so sincere. And they asked, different devotees asked on his behalf. And Mahaprabhu said, no, I cannot meet a king. And after, I think, maybe the third time the devotees asked, the Mahaprabhu said, stop asking. If you, if you continue to ask, he said, the answer is no. And if you continue to ask, I will just leave Jagannath Puri. So Mahaprabhu was playing this part. For this part, this aspect of the Leela, he was playing this part that I'm a sannyasi. I'm not going to see him. Stop asking me. I'm just not going to do it. And so what happened? Because if you know the story, Maharaj Prataparudra was able to see Lord Chaitanya. So what happened that Lord Chaitanya changed his mind? If you remember the story, it was during Ratyatra. Rata, Ratayatra. Not Ratayatra. Rata. Ratayatra. During Ratayatra. Ratayatra. Yatra. Ratayatra. Maharaj Prataparudra, who is the king, was sweeping the road in front of Jagannath. So, you know, the idea is I may be the king, but Jagannath is the lord of the universe, so I'm just a humble servant. When Mahaprabhu saw the humility of Maharaj Prataparudra, his heart melted, his heart changed. And at that point, in his mind and heart, he agreed, he agreed that Maharaj Prataparudra could meet him, and indeed he did get to meet him. So that was the factor that changed. So my point is that if you go through the Shastra, you'll see there are many such stories where a devotee exhibits humility and Mahaprabhu or or the Lord himself is attracted, if not melted, the heart is, if not attracted, melted by the devotee's humility. And if you go through the Shastra, you'll see different incidents different instances in which a devotee or demigod exhibits pride and Krishna is not pleased. In fact, often Krishna is upset. Uh, Often Krishna will chastise. Chastising is to humble the devotee. It's his mercy. Krishna does not like it. So pride is, is antithetical to love. Pride is the furthest thing from love of Krishna. And that's why Krishna doesn't like it. Krishna likes love. We know that. We've been discussing that a lot. How Krishna is Rasaraj and how everything that goes on in Krishna Leela, organized by Yoga Maya, is just churning, cooking down that ocean of love, cooking down that nectar milk of love, making it thicker and sweeter. And so where pride enters... It's antagonistic to love, unless the pride is transcendental. But where material pride enters, it's antagonistic. And it destroys love. It destroys the relationship. It destroys rasa. And that's why Krishna doesn't like it. And humility nourishes rasa. And that's why Krishna likes it so much. Okay. So we have um, some comment. Welcome to all of you. Nitananda Prabhu Jai. Krishna Karshani says, I think Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati said that searching for recognition is like taking bath in donkey urine. 
Um, I think that was Raghunath, who's Raghunath Das Goswami said it. There, there. Are, sometimes I get mixed up, pig stool and donkey urine, but I, I think there may be two different statements by two different devotees. One pig stool, one donkey urine. Anyway, we get the we get the message. Um, it's. In other words, the message is for a pure devotee, pride is not is very, um, it's abominable. So yeah, Bhakti Siddhanta used uh, Vaishnava K verse nine. Okay, let's read that. Thank you, Gora, for being here and presenting this. We'll read this, my dear mind. Your desire for cheap reputation can be compared to the stool of a hog. Yeah, so that's where the stool of a hog came. So I was right. And then the donkey urine is Raghunath Das Goswami, as far as I know. So in other words, something which has this horrible odor. Pride is like a horrible odor, especially to Krishna. Your desire for cheap reputation can be compared to the stool of a hog. You are proud of being a Vaishnava but your actual behavior is less than an ordinary civilized human being. Controlled by envy towards true Vaishnavas, you have secretly been relishing trying to squeeze out some temporary material happiness by gratifying your material desires. In other words, he's saying there are Vaishnavas who, who want to get sense gratification by being recognized as great devotees. How do you remain so proud in spite of your hypocrisy after having abandoned the eternal nectar of the Hare Krishna Sankirtan movement? Purport, now the mind has left the association of devotees due to jealousy, due to thinking that some other devotees are getting more facility and recognition. In this way, the mind is being envious and finding fault with the devotees, although the mind's desire is, in fact, to enjoy material sense gratification. It must adjust to the contradiction that it has already entered into devotional service and surrendered to the spiritual master. In order to do this, the mind must find fault. This is wrong. That is wrong. To make an excuse for leaving devotional service in association with the devotees to practice solitary worship. This rationalization gives an external excuse for the mind to separate itself from the association of devotees. But actually, this entangles the devotee in offenses and covers pure devotional service with ignorance. I find this, this quite interesting. There's a lot of things that have happened in the history of Gaudiya Vaishnava, Vaishnavism that for us as Westerners are sometimes difficult to understand. And what is being referred to is a problem in which a Vaishnava would do solitary bhajan, just chant all day, chant and chant shlokas, chant maha mantra. And in India, if you are a great sadhu, if you can do that, you will become recognized and people will honor you and people will maintain you. You won't have to worry. So, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta pointed out that there were a lot of people who actually did this not to develop love of Krishna, but to become recognized. And the desire for recognition is so strong that they would do this. And we as Westerners think, you know, this is so uncommon in the West. We don't see this amongst devotees. You know, like, you know, I chant 64 rounds and I, I put it up on Facebook every day with pictures of me, you know, in my bhajan kutir. And, you know, one, today I did 84 and I put that number up. And we don't, the, the, we don't do that. The closest thing to that is I got a million views on my, you know, YouTube video. A little note there, you know. But... I don't know the source for this, but when we did the Japa retreats, you know, we would chant 64 rounds, but there was time to chant more, so some devotees chanted more. And Generally, it's said, and this, I don't know the source, maybe some of you know the source, that you shouldn't tell anyone how many rounds you chanted because it, you lose the effect. And so... You know, some devotees chanted 80 or 90 rounds, but, you know, to go around and say, I chanted 80 or 90, it could have this effect on you, like, uh, I'm better than you, I chanted more, or you're becoming proud. So the, the general mood of the Vaishnavas is that they keep everything to themselves. 
So this solitary bhajan is kind of an advertising campaign that I'm a great sadhu, come and honor me. And so Srila Bhakti Siddhanta saw that. And it's not, it's not like it manifests for us in the same way, but we have to kind of equate it to how it could manifest, like telling people how many rounds I chanted or boasting about, you know, my latest YouTube videos got, you know, a million hits or whatever. We have to be careful about boasting. Uh, doing devotional service so I can be successful, so I can boast and then get the gratification of being honored. It's the same principle, it's just in a different form. So it's a different culture, a different context. But, but any kind of bhakti, if I'm doing it to be recognized, then I'm like that devotee who's chanting in a solitary place. Uh, and then sometimes Prabhupada said, yeah, they're chanting in a solitary place and what are they meditating on? Women and money. Because if you're, you know, fame is the, the, subtle, the subtle aspect of sex. So if you're meditating on fame, you must be meditating on sex. You're not free from it. I mean, at least even if you, you say you're free from it, you're not free from the subtle form of it. That's for sure. So that's, that's the idea. Thank you, Gora. Thank you, Krishna Karshini. Krishna Karshini says, One of the human needs is the need for recognition. What about a devotee? Devotee often needs to be recognized to be inspired in his service. Is searching for recognition a lack of humility? It may or may not be. I was having this discussion. I was joking with my wife. My wife had just given a... a yesterday she gave a workshop, a level one workshop on marriage. She's going to do three levels. Some of you may have been there. And part of the workshop... Uh, talks about appreciation. We should appreciate, you know, spouses should appreciate one another. And my wife is saying, you know. When spouses appreciate one another, then they'll, like, you know, they'll just do anything for one another because they'll feel so appreciated, and it's true. And I said, I said to her, you know, half-joking, I said, you know, but we're devotees, or so we're humble, so we don't want to be appreciated. So, she was replying more or less what you're saying, that it's a human need. And one way we can understand this is that if I appreciate other devotees, then my service to honor and glorify the devotees, which I should be doing, which is, is really one of the prime um, functions of the tongue, is to glorify Krishna and also to glorify the devotees, then I get the opportunity to glorify a devotee which is of great benefit for me. And if that devotee is humble, who's being glorified, they will take it in, in a way that they'll be humbled. And they'll take it in a way that it will inspire them to continue their service. So if Krishna Karshani, you say, I need to be appreciated, um, and it actually, when I'm appreciated, it makes me feel more humbled, and more inspired, then I would say, yeah, that's 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 how we want to adapt that human need of being appreciated to Krishna consciousness, to take it in a way that it will actually make me more humble and it will make me more inspired. You know, my guru appreciates me, and then I'm thinking, yeah, but it's all it's all really his mercy that I could do this. So his appreciation humbles me, but I'm happy to know that he appreciates. Uh, so I'm inspired to continue in that way because he's happy with that service. So um, I've un I've studied the six human needs and the the need the need for recognition. What is how do they say? Uh, is it do they use the word recognition? I don't know if they use the word recognition. What is the word? Does anybody know? Is it recognition or something? I believe it's something else. But whatever the word is, it could be recognition. Maybe somebody knows the exact word in Maslow's six human needs. Isn't it, isn't it, is it acknowledged? Well, the way that I've understood that it was explained, it was um, originally by Maslow and others, is it's not, it's not that the need is to be honored. The need is to 
is to feel, is to make a person feel that their life is of value, their contribution is of value. So as a fundamental human need, just to get out of bed, you need to feel that what you're doing is of value to others. So if you tell me, so I give class every day, and you tell me, your classes are helping me, so I don't become proud, but I feel I'm of value. My service to you has value. And as a result, I feel inspired to continue. I don't feel proud. I don't think, oh, oh, this is good. I'm a great teacher. Makes me feel good. That's material. But I feel like, oh, you appreciate it. Oh, thank you for telling me. I didn't know if anyone appreciated this. You do appreciate it. Okay, I'm inspired to continue. So it's that's how we would take it as a devotee. So it's it's an acknowledgement that what I'm doing has some value because, because I don't know if you understand this, but suicide, people feel suicidal at the point where they feel like their life has no value to anyone. And so if those people are valued, if those people are feeling that their life, their life is... Uh, their life has some value, some contribution. There's a reason to live. That will prevent them from giving up. And so, it, what it what that human need is? It's it's the it's a need to know that my life has value. Otherwise, if it doesn't have value, why would I want to live? So it's a little different than being honored and 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 wanting to be honored. Wanting to be honored. Oh, I think Bhakti Siddhanta said it's an evil desire. He used the word evil, yeah. He said the desire to be glorified in the assemble, assembly of devotees is evil. So evil is a heavy word. Yeah. Who would think, you know, the desire for honor is evil? But that's how he, uh, that's how he sees it, which is, of course, how Krishna sees it. So that that's something we should remember. But if... If I feel the need to be appreciated and and I think about why do I feel this need to be appreciated and it's not because I want everyone to think I'm great but I want to feel inspired in my devotional service then it's okay. I would also say you know how this problem is easily solved is if we create a culture of appreciation and we're all appreciating one another then just do the math, we'll all get appreciated. If we're all appreciating one another, everybody gets it. But you will also find perhaps a greater satisfaction in appreciating others than being appreciated yourself. There's something special about giving appreciation to others. And you can try it out today and see that it can, it can, it sometimes has this this, like many things in Krishna consciousness, if you give them, you get them, you're satisfied. You know, we've talked about this before, devotees who go to cook offerings for the deities, they go in the kitchen hungry, when they finish the offering, they're not hungry. So you go to honor, glorify, appreciate another devotee, and it satisfies your need to be appreciated or honored. That that also happens. Um, so I hope that answered your question. And... What is the actual word we're looking for? Uh, it's not the need to be recognized. Something else. So Krishna Krishna he says, is being humble possible for low self-esteem devotee? It's possible, but it could... Um, it's... It could... If... If process, if trying to be humble is not done properly or with proper understanding, then it actually could increase their low self-esteem. Because the problem is, what does humility mean? It means to be self-aware. And so to be aware of yourself is not always fun because being aware, you know, aware of yourself as spirit soul, yeah, that's fun because you're blissful, eternal, full of light, you're lovely and beautiful. 
But to be aware of yourself as a conditioned soul, to be aware of what's in your heart and what you're made of, sometimes that's not fun. Sometimes it's more like a horror movie or a nightmare. So a person with low, low self-esteem tends to live more in that horror movie nightmare than other people. They're more, they're more aware of the dark side of themselves and less aware of the bright side of themselves. Where, where people who have healthy self-esteem, they're aware of the dark side, but not overly aware of it, not to the point where it's like depressing them. Low self-esteem people tend to be more aware of, of their dark side and less aware, not even aware, of their bright side. So if someone is not careful, a devotee is not careful, and they have that tendency for low self-esteem or the tendency to be more focused on the bad, then if they practice humility and they're not careful about it, they become more aware of their faults, which could make them <laughs> depressed, discouraged. And humility is, is, should not make you depressed or discouraged because it's actually a transcendental quality. So it has to be done carefully. And I think one of the most, for me, one of the most inspiring aspects of humility and, and one of the most fun aspects is to say something like, let's go out and try something, which is, seems to be difficult or impossible. Let's go out and try it, and we'll depend on Krishna, and we'll see what happens. And, and so we make an effort to do some service which maybe extends us beyond either our comfort zone or beyond what we feel we're capable of. And then we put our hands up in the air and we say, Krishna, okay, let's do it. I'm jumping off the mountain. You know, you said you would catch me. Well, let's, we're going to find out right now. And you do something. And you see that Krishna gives you the ability or the intelligence. That's humility also. But that humility manifests in such an amazingly ecstatic way. So I would say for the person who has low self-esteem, Focus on aspects of humility which are more dependence-oriented, empowering-oriented. And um, the problem with low self-esteem, as I understand it in the Krishna conscious context, is that a lot of times we want recognition to build our self-image for ourself. So like, like Krishna Karshani, I let's say... I don't think I'm very smart, so if you tell me I'm smart, that will help me. And so I go see you, and I spend two weeks in Poland, and the whole time I'm there, you never told me I'm smart, and I don't like you. I actually resent you now, because I need you to tell me I'm smart, because I doubt that I'm smart, and I don't like feeling stupid. And because I feel stupid, the only way I won't feel stupid is for other people to tell me that I'm not stupid. That becomes a problem. And then I become dependent on others to pull me up. So I need the honor of others. More than appreciation, I need to be glorified a little bit because then it brings my self-esteem up. So that becomes a problem. That's where the two cross, the low self-esteem and the Krishna consciousness, that's where it can become unhealthy because I may need to be honored to get to zero just in my self-esteem. Whereas if I work on my self-esteem and I build it up to zero, then I don't need you to tell me I'm smart because I will feel like I'm smart or I'm smart enough. Smart enough to not feel that I'm stupid. But if I feel that I'm stupid, then I may need you and others to glorify me. And then the problem with that is I may start doing things to impress you so that you will tell me I'm intelligent. And then, then I'm trying to impress you instead of humbly trying to please Guru and Krishna. That's when it becomes a problem. So, you know, sometimes devotees say, well, does psychology affect your bhakti? And this is just one example of many examples I could give of how it does affect bhakti. And this is, you know, this is unfortunate some people have low self-esteem because that's they were just raised being put down. So it's understandable that they have a low Im image of themselves because that's what they heard growing up. But I would just say to such people, well, we're actually developing a... We have a self-esteem course online, but we're 
developing a new one, which is going to be much more thorough. But I would say to anyone who feels that they have low self-esteem, it's in the interest of your spiritual life to raise your self-esteem to a, a normal level, by any means, by a course, whatever you have to do, a book, a course. Uh, I've heard hypnosis can reprogram that feeling of being uh, less or unworthy. Because you will find that as your self-esteem goes up to normal points, if its self-esteem goes up too high, it becomes arrogance. So then it's already pride. So it's a balance between um, what we could, what seems like humility but isn't. It's just low self-esteem. And then arrogance. So if you get to the middle point where you have healthy self-esteem, which means you're not proud and, and you're not um, in need of being honored to feel good, that's going to help your spiritual life. So that's really important. So the answer is yes, psychology definitely affects affects us. And this is one big way that we're affected by it. And so, you know, nobody should feel bad if they have low self-esteem. Usually there's a reason. Either, you know, brought in from another lifetime or being put down in this lifetime by whoever puts you down. And if you hear if you hear you're stupid enough, you'll start believing it. Or <laughs> Not only believe it, you'll start doing it so you could believe it, just to, you know, because you think you are. That's the that's the saddest part, you know. You think you're stupid, you start doing stupid things just to validate your stupidity. So that's the short answer to what could be a whole workshop. Uh, so we have Manasiksha by Raghunatha Goswami. Commentary by SBVT. SBVT? Who's SBVT? Let me guess. Um, Bhakti. I don't know. You have to tell us. In spite of having subdued the enemies of lust and anger, one may not have conquered the great enemy of deceit. This verse instructs us how to gain victory over this powerful enemy. O oh, wicked mind. Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur. No. No, that's not it. Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Okay. I got it. Slow learner, but I got it. Okay. O oh, wicked mind, although you adopt the path of sadhana, you imagine yourself purified by bathing in the trickling urine of the great donkey full of full-blown deceit and hypocrisy. Uh, bathing in the trickling urine. Well, there we go again. Donkey, you, every time you, any time you become proud, you can think, I'm bathing in donkey urine right now. This is not smart. I should stop. By doing so, you are burning yourself and scorching me, a tiny jiva. Yourself, meaning the mind. Simultaneously, you're burning me and yourself. Stop this! Delight yourself in me by eternally bathing in the nectarian ocean of pure love for the lotus feet of Sri Radha Krishna Jugala. The overt deceit and hypocrisy which are present in a sadhaka, even after adopting the path of sadhana, are compared to the urine of a donkey, considering oneself to be intently engaged in bhajan while remaining devious and hypocritical at heart. It's like considering oneself pure by bathing in the filth. In the filth, should that be filthy? In the filth burning urine of a donkey. Okay, filth burning urine of a donkey. That's a different aspect of it than a, I had thought of, let me read that again. Considering oneself to be intently engaged in bhajan while remaining devious and hypocritical at heart is like considering oneself pure by bathing in the filth burning urine of a donkey. Oh, okay, so that's a different way I was looking at it, or not, at least another way that you're bathing in donkey urine, which is contaminating you, and you're thinking, I'm very pure. Hmm. Interesting. So, this Bhaktivinoda Thakur here and this verse also is pointing out the general 
the general idea of hypocrisy, which we first learned in Bhagavad Gita, Mitta Chara, Suchate, one who is doing one thing but thinking of the opposite, one who's very pure on the outside, uh, pretending to be, but inside uh, is not pure, is uh, Mitya Chara, a false actor. Mitya means false, pretender, Prabhupada translated. Pretender, pretender. We have that song by Gauravani in one of the verses. Pretender, pretender, surrender, surrender. Yeah. How did that song go? Um, he wrote it when he was 25. It's some, something like 25 years of doing it my way. In other words, playing God. Yeah. So... This is really important, and Srila Prabhupada writes about this in Chaitanya Charitamrita. He uses the word sardalata. Sardalata means simple. And what Prabhupada means by simple is not being duplicitous, because simple in, in this sense means one. Simple means one. Sardalata, actually, if, if you look at it, to, at least to me, from my study of it, it looks, looks like sardalata means integrity. Because integrity means one. One means you are one, inside and outside. What you see is what you get. With some people, what you see is not what you get. Take them home and there's, you know, well, I thought you were like this, but now I get you at home, I see there's another side. And that other side is much different from the side you show to the public. So you have your public persona and you have your private persona, right? With uh, That's why um, it, it's difficult to be famous because people fall in love with your public persona. Not They don't fall in love with who you are. They fall in love with your image. So anyway, we understand the principle. So, so sarlata is the opposite of Duplicity, being two different people, one on the outside, one on the inside. And so, if you study this in our scripture, basically you'll always see that the conclusion is that that doesn't work for bhakti. It's not, you can't be that way. You can't be trying to fool people. And, it, and sometimes it's worse when you fool yourself. You don't even recognize it. That's where you're really in trouble. You know, you're... You're duplicitous, duplicitous, and you're even fooling yourself to think that you're more Krishna conscious than you are. Then, then it's getting like double layers of illusion. <laughs> okay, that's a whole other. That's another workshop there on that topic, self deceit. We actually did that workshop uh, earlier in uh, in around this time. Last year we did in Mayapur. Many of you were there. Gora was there. And the first section was about self-honesty and how sometimes what we're talking about now is hard to admit. Even if we kind of know it's true, but it's hard to admit it. So self-honesty has so many layers because you have to be honest with yourself on the first level to admit the dishonesty <laughs> that you have. That's the second level. The second level is the dishonesty. The first level is admitting it so you can actually see it. So, um, you know, the problem is, is like when you become real, um, yeah. finally I became real about myself and it was a nightmare. So, you know, I decided to be unreal about myself. My life is much more pleasant now. So sometimes it's like that. But the fact is, you know, if we're not real about ourselves, how are we going to know that we're, you know, we're chanting, you know, for name and fame or doing something for name and fame unless we're real? And if we're doing something for name and fame, it's, we're not going to get very far in bhakti. Okay, Fabiola says, you were talking about proud. Proud is always bad as when someone says, I'm so proud of you. No, pride, proud is not always bad. If you say, I'm proud of you, that means you're actually glorifying them. And if you say, I am proud to be a devotee of Krishna, 
I am proud to be a follower of Srila Prabhupada, or I'm, if, if you're a disciple of Prabhupada, or grand disciple. I'm proud to be a disciple. I'm proud to be a grand disciple. I'm proud to be a disciple of this guru. I'm proud to be a member of this temple. I'm proud to be associated with these devotees. That is not the pride we're talking about. Uh, that is That pride makes you humble because that's an expression of humility. If I say I'm proud to be in your association, it actually means that I am honored. So it's actually an exhibition of your humility. I am honored to be here with you. I am honored to be in your association. I'm proud to be in your association. Same, same idea. So you have to understand what pride is so that you can evaluate whether you're actually being proud or humble. And specifically, you know, really, pride is like stealing Krishna's position, you know, because all honor should go to him. All glories to Sri Guru and Goranga. All glories for them. And so, oh, Prabhu, throw a few glories my side. You know, I need a few. No, we throw all to them. So if your mood is that all glories to my guru, all glories to the other devotees, all glories to Prabhupada, all glories to Mahaprabhu, all glories to Nitananda. If that's your mood, then, then whatever you say, whatever you do, even if it seems like pride, it's not. But if your mood is, okay, all glories, all glories to Prabhupada, but how, how about I get 10% of that? You know, Can I get 10% just because I said all glories like so enthusiastically? Everybody, did you see that? Did you see that, how enthusiastically I said that? Can I get 10% of those glories? Then you're in trouble. Now, have you ever done devotional service with a desire to get 10% of the glories? No, Prabhu, I've done it to get 100%. Yeah, right. Have you ever led a kirtan with a desire to give 100% of the glories to Krishna? Or have you done a kirtan to get 100% of the glories for yourself? Or maybe Krishna will divide 50-50 in this kirtan. You know? Well, if it's like, let me lead a good kirtan and I'll give you back 50%. Yeah, so if you take 1%, that's 1% too much. So now look at your life and ask yourself, have I ever done some service with a motive to get recognized for it? And if you answered no, you are a number one liar. Because as conditioned souls, we must have done some service or many services somewhere in the back of our mind or deep down in the recesses of our heart, there was some thinking that uh, maybe I'll get honored for this. Yes or yes? If you say no, you uh, just send me an. If you say no, send me an email, and I'll send you the self honesty worksheet, and you can work it. <laughs> then you'll realize. No, so, so the point is, how how can you get to pure devotional service if you don't even know what your motives are? Because pure devotional service, anyabilashito shunyam. There's, you know, we're. We're going to be discussing tomorrow. There's a class at 11. I don't even know if it's been advertised. There's a class at 11 o'clock on the conversation between Ramananda Roy and Lord Chaitanya, and that's part of the GBC SPT or something. They're doing, you know, having like a hundred and so many classes every day leading up to Gaur Purnim. And so in that conversation, it's all about pure devotional service. Everything Ramananda Roy says to Mahaprabhu about bhakti. That's not pure bhakti. Lord Chaitanya says, go further. Well, it's not enough. It's not what I want to hear. So when he gets to pure bhakti, Lord Chaitanya says, okay, we're, now we're talking. So how, how are we going to understand what pure to bhakti is if we don't even understand our own motives? Because pure bhakti means to not have the motive for anything material. And to be honored is a motive for something material. Now, I don't want to make you all feel bad. Oh, you're making me feel so bad now. Um, because I realize that practically everything I do, I want to get honored. Yeah, well, it's good to realize that because pure devotional service means I just want to honor Krishna and the other devotees. I don't want honor for myself. And in order to get to that stage, I have to know, I have to know, I have to be in touch with my motives. I have to, am I doing this? 
and, and uh, to be honored. And if I am, I should catch myself and I should only be doing it to serve. Whether I'm honored or not, like that purport in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, it's so, it's so important for us. And Prabhupada said, the purpose of writing is not to become a famous author. The purpose of writing is self-purification. And also as a writer, I can say at least how I feel, and I think all writers, at least Krishna conscious writers, feel this way. They think, I don't know how many people will read what I'm writing, but if one person reads it and benefits from it, it was worth it. It was worth writing it, because someone will benefit from this. But like Prabhupada said, if I could make one person a pure devotee, then I would consider my mission successful. So, you can understand Prabhupada's mood in writing his books. It was not to make business, not to make money, not to become a famous author, but to serve the world, make the world Krishna conscious, serve his disciples. So that's the mood. So if you catch yourself in any other mood, like you're cooking for the deities and you're thinking, oh, this is going to be so good and devotees are all going to line up praising how good this prasadam is. I'm going to walk in the prasadam room and I'm going to hear them going, hmm, Mmm, it's so good. And then I walk in and they'll all applaud. There's the cook. All praises to the cook. And that's what you're thinking while you're cooking? Well, if that's what you're thinking, you're in deep trouble because that is the exact opposite of the way we're supposed to be thinking. Now, we are conditioned souls, so we think that way. My point is not that you don't think that way, but to catch yourself thinking that way and to understand that is not the way we want to think. I think I am cooking to please the deity. That's it. That's it. I am giving this class to serve the Vaishnavas. I'm going on book distribution to help conditioned soul. I'm not doing these things to be recognized, to get a big following or a big a lot of hand claps. That is the proper mood. So so if you say, I'm proud of you, I'm proud of being a devotee, I'm proud of, and the mood is that you're just humbled and honored, that's not pride. That's a good question. I'm glad you brought it up. Thank you, Fabiola. That was a Fabiola, a Fabiolius, Fabiolius question. Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, that demon, Keshi, that the demon Keshi represents the mentality, I'm a great devotee and great guru. Yeah. Here we have the ass again. Yeah, the donkey is show the donkey is showing up with pride. Right? You're just a donkey and you don't even realize it. Uh, hmm. uh, outside it looks like nectar inside. I'm a donkey. I'm a donkey inside. Outside, I'm pretending to be a Vaishnava. Hmm. Not a good policy. Validation. Contribution. Significance is the word, I think. Significance. Okay, yeah. Significance. Could be. The need for significance, which is different than the need. It sounds like Significance sounds like, well, you want to be honored. But significance means the need to know that my life and my actions are significant enough that I should actually not kill myself today. That's basically, you know, because obviously you can see it as a human need. I need to know that I'm of value. Um, thank you, Gora. Do we need appreciation because the false ego is naturally insecure? There can be many reasons. Of course, one of the problems is it's an ingrained human need. So the more you're human, the more you'll need it. The more you're transcendental, the less you're human. <laughs> the less your human needs are, are controlling you, so the less you'll need it. So, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't make devotees feel that wanting to be appreciated is wrong as long as... As long as we understand two things. Yes, it's a human need. I want to be appreciated because it inspires me in bhakti. But if it's coming from a place of weakness where you become addicted to it and dependent on it, 
It's unhealthy for you and it's unhealthy for relationships because you won't like people who don't appreciate you if you're addicted to it, right? So it's definitely a human need, but we want to kind of tweak it and purify it and say my need to be appreciated is just to know that my service is of value, right? So if I say, Satyarupa, you did a really good job on this, keep up the good work, you'll feel inspired. And if I say, Satyarupa, you completely messed it up, then you're probably thinking, well, maybe I shouldn't do it. But if I say, you messed it up, I really appreciate your effort, can you correct it? Can you, can you improve it here? And, and um, you know, I really, I know you tried. Then you feel like, okay, I can do it. So human nature, it's human nature. But it's true that as we advance, the need to be appreciated, I just want, I just want to know my guru is happy with me. That's all. That's, my, that's all I want to know. Um, Jairati said, it's a beautiful explanation on that need. Thank you. You know, you know, Jairati, what we're, Jairati is a, a psychologist. So what we're, what we're trying to do is understand psychology in relation to devotional service and the practices. And, and because, you know, devotional service adds an element to our lives that is different from the lives of non-devotees, unless they're very spiritual or religious. And what we see, unfortunately, is that a lot of things can backfire. So then just like Krishna Karshani was pointing out, it, my effort to be humble can backfire, and, and then it turns out to be increasing my low self-esteem or creating, maybe I didn't have low self-esteem, and it creates it. So then my effort to become humble becomes kind of a psychological dysfunction, which then impairs my ability to do devotional service in a better and more pure way. So we have to, you know, we have to, as, as devotees who are inclined to understanding psychology, we, we, have to, we have to really be expert at understanding how some of the devotional processes can negatively, potentially, not always, but potentially have negative effects on psychology. You know, like everyone has a need to belong, right? So let's use another negative example of psychology. We have the need to belong. We all do. It's a human need. Let's say your need is very strong and you feel insecure if you don't belong. You're not accepted in the group. Okay, it's understandable, right? Maybe not the healthiest, but you know, I want to be a valued, accepted member, like an insider. That, that's what makes me feel good. Okay. How does that become a problem? becomes a problem because someone takes initiation before they're qualified. Because when you're initiated, then officially, you are now an insider. When you're not initiated, you could feel like an outsider, although you shouldn't. But there are symbols. Uh, i not formally connected. I can't say, that I can say this is my guru, but he's my six-year guru because I haven't been initiated yet or I'm aspiring. So technically speaking, he's my six-year guru. So I'm not initiated. So I'm not an initiated devotee. I don't have a spiritual name. So I'm still like an outsider, and I have this need to belong that's so intense that I take initiation even before I'm qualified because psychologically, if I don't belong, I'll go, I'll have a problem. So that would be another example of a, of a weakness that could impel someone who is not qualified to be initiated, to prematurely take it so they could be belong, belong. Or it's exacerbated by the fact that they not may not be treated by the devotees as, you know, like you say something, well, who are you? You're not initiated. Why should I listen to you? So then, it, then we're exacerbating a problem they may already have, or we may be even actually planting a seed for a problem they didn't have before they joined ISKCON. And now they're feeling like, yeah, well, no one will listen. You know, I want to take charge of this project, but I'm not initiated, so I can't do it. Or I'm not initiated, I can do it, but I find no one's listening to me. So then we have a problem there. That's not a psychological problem. That's a problem created by other devotees. Why should I listen to you? Why? You can't give class. You're not initiated. Okay, well, let me get initiated tomorrow so I can give class. 
ready or not. Well, who should I get initiated? Yeah, of anybody, it doesn't matter, just get it. And now you're initiated in the whole, you know, I'm initiated, I'm Krishna Das now, now you have to listen to me. So, um, th so there, there, are, there are potential problems within cultivating Krishna consciousness and we have to understand them, especially devotees who are counselors and so forth, because some of these are unique to the life of a devotee, right? You have a spiritual master, right? Then you have another problem. You lost your father when you were young, or your father was absent, or your father was mean, or he was an alcoholic or something, and now you get a guru, and you know, finally you have a father, and you're trying to replace your biological father with your guru. It doesn't work. He's not your biological father. So that's another problem, and that's quite common. And I think that's going to become more common as it seems like parents are not doing their job so well. So, you know, okay, you know, you can latch on to someone if you're not a devotee, but every devotee is going to have a guru, so you all have every everyone has someone to latch on to. The devo the guru is your father spiritually, but he, if you want to replace what you missed materially, then it could become dysfunctional, as it, it could become a relationship which becomes corrupted by that. So that's another you know. I mean, I people say you know psychology doesn't affect bhakti. I could spend. I could spend hours telling you all the ways I've seen it affect bhakti. And not just in our movement, I read a book written by someone else, and she said the same thing. You know, there's so many psychological elements. Uh, and what to speak, what to speak, I'm not a woman, I don't know, I don't think this has happened to me, maybe it has, and I'm like too much uh, in a stupor to notice it. What if a female disciple becomes in love with their guru uh, in a conjugal way? I guess that hasn't happened to me. I'm too old. But it must have happened in the early days when the gurus were in their, you know, like 28 and their disciples were like 27 and a half. Yeah. So, you know, these things are going on. Okay, so now we get to read about a little more detail. The need for... Uh, Need for meaning, validation, feeling needed, honored, wanted, special. Yeah, but it's all, it's all in the, uh, for us, this need has to be purified in the need for knowing that I pleased the Vaishnavas, I pleased my guru. That's, that's how we, we have to take and tweak human nature and human needs. So not that I want to be in the center, but I just want to know that my guru is happy, the devotees are happy, Krishna is happy like that. Prabhupada's happy. Okay, it's the hot topic. It's 9.26, and we've got a lot of comments or questions. If we have, this is from, uh, wait, 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 wait. Christy. How deep should we dig in self-analyzation without becoming my as well? If we go too much into the dark side, it can make us feel depressed seeing how many flaws we still have. Yeah, but I would, it's true, but that could be a symptom of low self esteem. Um, but one thing, you know, I would, I would say, Christy, then, you know, go carefully. If it's, if it's making you depressed, then, you know, better focus on the positive sides of Krishna consciousness. But we do, we do find in the prayers of the Vaishnavas, they go pretty deep into their dark side. So, you know, the point is, is if, if, you, if you go into your dark side and you start judging, that's when you're going to have all the problems, all the depression. But if you just see it, oh, this is like, you know, something I have to work on. You know, like you go to the doctor and the doctor says, well, you know, your liver is a little weak. And you go, I knew it. I have a bad liver. I'm so bad. I can't believe it. I'm such a horrible person. My liver is bad. And the doctor is looking at you thinking, what are you talking about? So, you know, I have a, a bad anartha. You know, it's called envy. Well, welcome to the club. All right. And now I start judging myself. The healthy way is just work on it. You don't have to judge it. It just, it just is, you know. 
So that's where you run into trouble. So if you're not ju making judgments on, so bad, I'm like envious, no one's more envious than I am. Like, I can't even believe that Krishna allows me to serve him, you know. Probably tomorrow he's going to kick me out of Krishna consciousness. Well, if you're thinking like that, the envy is not the problem, it's the way you're looking at the envy. That's the problem. And all those other things you're saying are actually indications of a deeper problem than the envy, right? If you're thinking because you're envious, Krishna's going to kick you out of the ISKCON. No, that's a bigger problem than the envy. So, so you know, you need to be aware of these things to like, you know, otherwise you kind of live in a stupor. But it's, you know, it's all about self-acceptance. Okay, I'm envious. You know, like, so is everybody. Like, what, what else is new, you know? Okay, let's work on it. How can I? So I'm studying it. I'm, I'm trying to be more appreciative. I'm trying to be more supportive of devotees. I know I'm envious. I want to, you know, give other devotees opportunity to serve. I'm happy when they're successful. This is how I'm working on my envy. I'm not like thinking, I can't get out of bed. I'm envious. You know, there's no use to my life anymore. That's the problem. So if that's the problem, then forget the envy. Just focus on those other things and realize that it's self-acceptance, self-compassion, that's that's where you need to work on. And once you have self-acceptance, self-compassion, then you just look at those things and go, okay, another anarta. How do I work on this one? You know, I'm proud. Okay, so what do I do? All right, maybe I need to pr praise devotees. Okay, I'm lazy. What do I do? Okay, tomorrow, as soon as the alarm goes off, I'm going to jump and hit the ceiling. That's my new my new plan. So, you know, you have to have strategies to deal with your anarthas. And if you just kind of ignore, oh, look at it. It's, ah, ah. But that's the mode of ignorance. I don't look at my life, they're so ugly. Oh. Yeah, and then they're gonna, you know, they're not gonna get any more beautiful by not looking at them. <laughs> Appropriate self-love is the key, yeah. You know, um, I think an important point is nothing is bad and nothing is good. It's how you make it, you know. Is love good or bad? Well, love could drive you crazy and love can get you back to Godhead. I mean, material love. You know, is envy bad? Well, there's transcendental envy, and I'm envious of you because you're such a great devotee and, and that I'm inspired by you, so the envy could inspire me. So when my wife was first giving this course on the six human needs, after each need, she would just say, find a healthy way to satisfy this need, because because if you find it, it's a need that you have, just find a healthy way to satisfy. I have the need to be honored. I have the need to be appreciated. What would be a healthy way to fulfill that need? You have to figure that out. And then eventually transcend or or eventually like those needs will become more transcendental as you advance. That's a fact. I mean, even the pure devotee has these needs, but they're not so human anymore. They're pretty transcendental. The need for security, yeah. What's the security a, de a pure devotee needs? To be a particle of dust at Krishna's feet, that's his security. What's the variety? You know, different exchanges of variety and leela, right? You know, what's the recognition? Krishna, give me a sidelong glance and melt my heart. You know, so the needs will be there, but they, they'll elevate themselves. Jairadi says, if we have negative beliefs about ourselves, no amount of recognition or glorification will fulfill that need unless it's addressed. Fantastic. Straight from the mental, what's the place you work for? The Department of Mental Health. Straight from the, Depart the London Department of Mental Health. We've got that wisdom. Yeah. <laughs> That's such a good point. Cause, because, you know, you have a problem that you're trying to get other people to fix, but they can't fix it because the problem is your negative belief about yourself. And so if they glorify you, it's not necessarily going to fix it. Good point. And now we have John from the University of, and I don't know what it is, who's a professor of counseling. Or we got, it's going to be a one two punch here. One two punch. Yeah, we're going to get another nugget here. Accepting appreciation graciously, I think, is different than trying to compulsively please others, like family, etc. I had to work on that one. Still do. As a child, I caught the attention of my parents by being religious. Pumped me up. Still do. Um, still does at times. Now I pray to learn 
how to please Krishna and just be one of the gang. Yeah. <clears throat> what are all the crazy, you know, like, why did you become a devotee? What was the reason? Or was it like, was it for the right reason? I hope. Maybe not. Maybe there are other reasons. And if the reasons were wrong, we have to purify them. Krishna says, pride is like stealing Krishna's position because all glory should go to him. Yeah. That's what I said, right? How to protect ourselves from the mentality, I'm a great devotee, I'm a great guru, I'm a great leader. Just be real and you realize you're not. <laughs> That's how. Humility means to be real. You're not such a great devotee. You're not such a great guru. You're not such a great leader. And if you are, it's only because Krishna gave you the intelligence. I mean, this is how I protect myself. Anytime I do something, like sometimes I'll give a class and after the class, I'll think, wow, that was a good class. Like, you know, I don't always think it's a good class. I mean, I always think it's a good class. It's always, speaking about Krishna is always good. But some classes are like, wow, that was really good. And I've trained myself to automatically think, thank you, Krishna. That was totally coming from you. I just, it's a default setting that I've worked on setting. Or that was a good class. That was a good kirtan, default setting. Thank you, Krishna. You allowed me to glorify you, and the devotees were inspired. And I wasn't croaking like a frog today, by your mercy. I've just I've set myself that default setting when any whenever I do something, which I could recognize objectively. Well, that was good. I mean, not falsely humble. Don't recognize it. No, I recognize that was good. Uh, and just. I've trained myself, Krishna has helped me train myself because Krishna told me, uh, or it was revealed to me through my intelligence that if you don't think this way, you're going to be in big trouble. You're not going to be Krishna conscious if you try to take credit for it. And that's what the false ego does. The false ego wants to take credit for everything. When um, <laughs> I had a friend, my best friend when we were young, we would talk about something, we'd come up with an idea, right? And if he liked the idea, if I came up with the idea and he liked the idea, then his joke was, I'm glad I thought of that. So it's kind of like that. You know, you get this great idea and you think, oh, I'm amazing. I got this idea. No, that Krishna gave it to you. So that's how you stay humble. Uh, Jai Shri and Toshan. Which one is asking? It must be Jai Shri. Is it okay to share with Guru particular service that you did that you feel good with? Yeah. Toshan just did it yesterday. Preaching Krishna Conscious on TV. Yeah, I was. Um, Toshan is being featured on a television show, and I was so happy to hear that. Even though it would look like that it's shared to be recognized. No. See, the, the thing is, it's not what you do, it's the mentality you do it with. Because you can do like the most pure thing and the worst mentality. And you can do something which doesn't seem pure, like I want to show everyone this show and I'm the star of the show. And, you know, like 10 million people have seen this show and, and Krishna consciousness is like expanding now because of this show. And I'm so excited, not because I'm the, the person being interviewed in the show, but I'm excited because of look what happened. So as long as you have the right mentality, there's no problem. And as long as you have the, the wrong mentality, everything's a problem. Yeah. Uh, Gora says, regarding deceit, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur comments in Raghunath Das's Goswami's Mani Shiksha, it is stated, Parish, Pari Nishtita, the Pari Nishtita Sadaka performs all his activities in accordance with the rules and prohibitions laid down for the service and attendance of Bhagavan. Both these types of sadakas are grihastas. The Nirapeksha Sadaka is a renunciate. All three are benefited only when they become thoroughly honest. Whoa, Chris Day, did you hear that? Otherwise, by resorting to deceitfulness, they are surely vanquished. The hypocrisy demonstrated by these three is described below. Ah, wow, we're getting some heavy nectar here. One, deceit of the Swanishtita Sadaka. A. Indulging in sense enjoyment on the pretext of sadhana bhakti. 
serving wealthy and influential materialists instead of unpretentious devotees. Accumulating wealth beyond one's needs, having great enthusiasm for futile temporary enterprises, indulging in illogical arguments on the pretext of cultivating knowledge. And that's like knowledge, the sense gratification of knowledge, just speculating endlessly. Adopting the dress of a renunciate to get material prestige. Prabhu, why do you want to take sannyas? Oh, it's obvious. I'll get Mahaprasadam, all the girls are like me, and I'll be honored. Why wouldn't I want to take sannyas? Make deceit of the parinishtita sadhaka, making an external show of strict adherence to rules and regulations, but remaining inwardly attached to material subjects, and B, preferring the association of philanthropists, jnanis, yogis, and materialists, materialistic people to that of resolute loving devotees. Deceit of the nirapeksha sadhaka. So there's different classes of devotees and their deceit comes out in different ways. To maintain pride by thinking oneself to be an elevated Vaishnava. To adopt the dress of a renunciate and due to false ego regard other sadhakas as inferior. To accumulate wealth and materials beyond the basic necessities of life. To associate with women on the pretext of sadhana to keep close contact with materialistic people with the intention of collecting funds and donations, to worry about collecting funds on the pretext of performing bhajan, to ineffable, to ineffable one's attachment. Is that how you pronounce that? Enf, is that a, two Fs? Enfable? I think, I didn't pay attention in class. To enfable, or is that a misspell, spelling, or what's going on here? Tell me. One's attachment to Krishna for attributing importance and respect merely to the external dress and symbols of the renounced order and by being over, overly attached to the rules and regulations. Therefore, the defects of mundane arguments, kutarka, false philosophical conclusions, Kusiddhanta and Anarthas, all arising from deceit in the domain of bhajan, have been compared to the urine of a donkey. So these are all, Chris Day, this answers your question. These are all the things that can happen if you if you can't look at your what you're actually doing, be honest about your motives. So all this is the dishonesty about where one is at and what their motives are. <coughs> What are the signs of trying to replace one's biological father with one's diksha guru? Um, unhealthy dependency. You always need, you'll need your guru to say you're good like three times a day. And if he didn't say it three times yesterday, you're mad at him. You're depressed. He doesn't love me. He doesn't like me. I did something, he, he didn't say anything, that means he doesn't like me anymore. Things like that, you know, just irrational things. Things that are not normal. Uh, Sri Radha says, are there women's bhakti psychology classes going on anywhere taught by a woman? Not yet, but could be. You know, in other words, to deal with women's psychology as opposed to men, that's something. Anybody want to do it? Jai Radhe, you want to do it? I don't think I can do it. I don't know. Maybe John can do it. Maybe you've taught me. John, have you ever taught anything like that? How uh, to deal with the female psychology in a healthy way? Fabiola has a question. Why in Krishna consciousness you say that a true has to say three times or something like that? No, um, you say you say it three times to emphasize it. In other words, like if I say, if I say Fabiola, you should chant. Let's say I, I, let's say you're starting Krishna consciousness. I say you should chant four rounds a day, and I say Fabiola, you should chant four rounds a day. You should chant four rounds a day. You should chant four rounds a day. Then you think, oh, I guess that's important. He said it three times. That's, I don't know, I don't know the history of that. But generally, if something's important, people repeat it, right? I told you not to put your dirty dishes over there. I told you. How many times have I told you? 
not to put you in. Okay, I guess it's important. So it's like that. Christy says, I have massive problems with self-esteem. So, uh, welcome to the club, Christy. You are a normal woman. But we're coming to your rescue because we're developing a course. Mm. Okay. We're coming to the end here. Sadvi Sangha. Okay, yeah. Christy, uh, well, who, asked, who asked for a women's psychology class? There's Sadvi Sangha. That could help as a starter. So we have the link for Sadvi Sangha. Uh -uh. Yeah, um, Dr. Mai is saying, well, I can't have a problem with my guru because he doesn't read my messages. Yeah, maybe I should stop reading messages. Then I won't have any problems anymore. Hmm, interesting. Let me, maybe I'll try that. I'll have the pro but the problem is I'll have is I'll have 500 emails and I won't know which one to read. Like the one from the IRS that says, we're going to take your house away from you if you don't pay this. I could miss that one. That would be a problem. Okay. Thank you, everyone. We're going to go. That was a nice class. We didn't get to read much, but important topic. Hare Krishna to all of you. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. <laughs>